at the integrated learning with your professors and with the clinicians, then it makes a lot of sense. When you go to the clinical area, you will understand why you had to learn what you learned in the preclinical area and, and apply that because here you will see not only the, uh, what you knew from a normal point of view, but then you will start seeing disease and different disease states, and we call that pathology. So pathology will start uh, as classes for you, and you will also interact with patients. So you will have rotations in different areas. And then these patients will have different disease states, and then you can try to see what the disease state is with reflection to what normal is. And, and then the pathophysiology will teach you uh, why this disease is behaving the way it's behaving and why is it different from the, from the normal. And that's because it could be from either bacterial infection or it could be a malignancy or it could be a congenital problem with a hereditary defect in the biochemical pathway. And uh, you will see various disease states from early disease to late disease and making a bedside uh, diagnosis is, is crucial because that'll what will determine whether you are a smart individual or not a smart individual. So pathology is very, uh, you know, just like physiology, here you will be looking at the differences in uh, what normal is and what is not, uh, not normal. And at the same time, the, you will be learning pharmacology, which is the relationship of the different drugs that you will be giving. And some of these drugs could be, for instance, antibiotics. And the antibiotics uh, will be used to treat different infections. <clears throat> and how do you treat, how do you diagnose the, the infection and what antibiotics do you use? And when do you use them? What is the dose? And uh, what's the duration of treatment? How do you follow up these patients? All that will come into the picture. So there's a lot that you will be learning at that time. And uh, you will integrate uh, the preclinical subjects into the clinical arena and looking at the interactions of uh, the different drugs. Now, knowing all the drugs is going to be not easy. So the, luckily, the pharmacology teachers have broken down the different uh, topics into different areas, for instance, uh, anti-cancerous drugs, anti-hypertensives, treatment of diseases like diabetes, and things like that. So, so it's, a, it's a good time to pick those up. And there are manuals that will teach you about how these drugs need to be given, and what is the dose, and, and you will learn about pharmacokinetics, which means when you give a certain drug, it goes into the body and it distributes throughout the body. And what is the blood level that is required to treat the patient is what you will be learning. Now, the, uh, as a pharmacologist, uh, the professors and teachers have done a lot of studies to figure out uh, what should be the dose and what route should be used for giving to these patients so that they can get the required blood level and the blood level has to be maintained for the for the treatment of the, of the illness. So uh, it, it becomes uh, quite an interesting year for you in the clinical uh, uh, area. In the clinical area, uh, you should try to find a good mentor who can help you so that uh, you can interact with that mentor and get to see as many patients as possible. And while you're learning, uh, to try to figure out uh, what are the things that are important. I'm hoping that your professors will teach you how to do bedside examinations. Uh, those are things that you have to learn and uh, you have to have a systematic way to approach uh, these, uh, these patients uh, so that you don't miss anything and doing a proper history, a proper physical uh, demonstrating that you are a person genuinely interested in taking care of the patient and having the patients as well as the uh, time that you can spend with the patient to build not only a good bond, but a relationship so that the patient can, can divulge as much information to you 
so that nothing is left out and, and you need to make a, a, a quick diagnosis uh, after you get the symptoms correlated with the physical findings. Now, uh, when I was a student, you know, we were given rotations in, in different areas, it, like medicine, like uh, surgery, like pediatrics, like obstetrics and gynecology, and uh, the emergency room, um, uh, things like that. So uh, you, you should make the best of these rotations. The, the thing that at this time you have to do is you have to try to figure out, am I going to be a family practice doc? Or am I going to be a pathologist? Am I going to be an anesthesiologist like myself? Am I going to be a surgeon? So you start building uh, an interest in the different subjects. You've learned about anatomy, you've learned about physiology, biochemistry, you're learning about uh, pathology in the clinical area, you're looking at disease, and you're looking at uh, the treatment of disease. And then you'll, you have a patient-doctor relationship, and you figure out what is it that, uh, that you like the most. Now, the other thing is, uh, in India, fortunately, you have a very good exposure to community medicine, and uh, we call that public health over here. And community medicine, again, is, is something that many people may like to do because you know, there you can impact masses of people rather than one particular individual at a time. And at the same time, when you learn through these things, uh, we, at, at least in the United States, we also have opportunities for, for people either to pursue uh, an additional uh, few years and go into Masters of Public Health, or they can go into uh, Masters of Health Administration and things like that. So you, you can build up uh, an attachment to different things during, this, uh, uh, during these clinical years, okay? Now, one thing I wanted to mention is that in the United States, which we didn't have when I was a student in India, is we didn't have a mentorship program. And it's in the, in the US, almost every medical student has a mentor and has an advisor. And those uh, uh, mentors and the student, the mentee, meet regularly so that the students get proper guidance. And then if they have any questions, or if they have any uh, uh, things that they would like advice upon, the mentor will give them feedback. And if, uh, if for any reason the mentor finds that the student is not up to the mark, then the mentor will take action and try to bring the student up to the mark that they need to be. And that has worked very well. Now, that's one thing that's lacking in India. And, and, and I think uh, that's something that should be started and, and it's a program that, you know, if, if, people, if we can't get that in here, that's something that maybe we can, I can work on and try to get uh, students mentors, even from the US now, because we have technologies to make that possible. Uh, uh, the role of a mentor is crucial because they can guide uh, people in the right direction. They can provide them not only contacts, but they, they can tell them what's good for them and what's what they need to improve upon and things like that. So uh, this is very valuable. And uh, every medical school in the United States has that uh, program. <clears throat> so the once you've done your preclinical and you've done well in your exams, and now you're in the clinical area and you're learning all the uh, things on pathology, pharmacology, uh, even forensic medicine, and some parts of community medicine, there will be exams for those subjects also, but those are not as difficult as the first preclinical area because they're quite interesting and you will need to uh, do well in those exams also. So the hard part of medical school is that they expect that every student will be above the minimal mark. And then the ones that get the higher marks will have find it easier to get into uh, internship uh, programs, uh, and then uh, they will be the ones that will then be selected for postgraduate uh, training. So it's a good idea to start uh, finding which areas are good for you and focus on those particular areas if you can, and then do well in the other subjects also so that you have a broad understanding of medicine. 
and and then when you when you start picking an area that you like you should try to build up a relationship with with individuals who are experts in that area and then maybe even do a small uh, research project or two with those individuals uh, which means you have to work a little extra which is not bad i think because then that improves your biography and your curriculum vitae and uh, you you become eligible for acceptance into a postgraduate program now once you've done that uh, in india there's an obligatory rotating internship which is part of your medical school uh, whereas in the united states once you finish your preclinical and clinical areas you pass the usmle part 2 and the part 3s and the clinical science exam and then you have to do what's called a matching into a residency of your choice and then during that residency there will be a the first year is usually similar to the internship that you will be doing in india the the internship is uh, is quite exciting you have to work very hard uh, you will be the point person for patients uh, that you will be seeing and you will be working both in the clinic as well as in the hospital and you will be assigned as as an intern depending upon whether you're in medicine or surgery you will be assigned uh, several patients and those patients have to be worked up they have to be uh, they uh, rounded upon at least two three times a day you will be answering questions you will be doing the laboratory exams that are required for that and you'll be working with your with your professor or your clinician uh, attending that's going to be rounding on these patients with you and, uh, and obviously the attending will make sure will try to find out as much information as they can by not only uh, listening to you but hoping that you have spent time in examining the patients and have come up with a differential diagnosis and also trying to figure out what are the orders that need to be made and what tests need to be done uh, coordinate this with the different uh, laboratories in the hospital if they have to be fasting for instance for a test the next day when they are in the hospital those are things that you will learn and you have to be you know uh, energetic and you got to figure out uh, how to handle all these patients and a system of remembering each patient is important so you know, we actually have ipads for our interns and they have all the data stored on the ipad and pretty much everything is electronic over here and i'm, I'm uh, and i heard that in india also it's picking up uh, but the intern is very important because he or she keeps all the data ready for the attending to review when you're around and then you'll take care of the patient learn from your for your attending and your professor as much as you can the different clinical signs as well as the relationship of the disease to the to the uh, other findings that are available through through investigations like the ct scan or an mri or through uh, laboratory tests and uh, things like that so uh, the rotating internship you you will see lots of things and you will be handling many patients uh, you should try to become good at uh, some of the technical things like uh, placing an iv intravenous line uh, learning how to do arterial lines if you can when during your rotations in the icu and doing some procedures when you're rotating in the emergency room learning how to you know do minor stitching and uh, suturing things like that so and, and I learn a little bit about uh, how do you resuscitate somebody and how do you uh, uh, order the different drugs that are needed and uh, uh, making sure that you know you will be the person who will know everything about that patient that you're taking care of and so you will have to look at uh, problems that might occur you have to look for side effects of things that you're doing and uh, interacting to those things because because the attending will ask you have you done this have you done that what is wrong and you have to give the progress report for for these patients um as part of the rotating internship you will be uh, going into different areas you'll be uh, looking at children you'll be doing some deliveries in 
you know, we uh, you learn some suturing there for episiotomies, things like that. What is breach presentation? When do you do a C-section? Things like that. Uh, what is the rapid transfusion protocol for somebody with placenta previa? Uh, and how do you handle somebody that comes into the ER who has multiple wounds, multiple fractures? How do you stabilize the head and neck? Uh, when do you call for an assistant to help you? Uh, uh, do you intubate somebody by keeping the neck stable, neutral position, things like that? There's a lot to learn as an intern. So I really enjoyed my internship, uh, which I did at St. Martha's Hospital in Bangalore. Uh, we had a great uh, team of people. And uh, I also was able to, during my surgical rotation, actually do some appendectomies and uh, uh, do a lot of uh, gastrojejunostomies in those days, which were a common operation. So I think uh, I've given you a good background of the preclinical, clinical and internship areas. And I think the, with this background, I'm sure all of you have lots of questions. And I think right now I'm willing to have an open forum and, uh, and answer any questions you might have. Dear attendees, now it is an opportunity for all of you to ask your doubts and questions to doctor. Please feel free to ask any questions related to the topic and uh, doctor will definitely try to address your concerns. So. Good evening, sir. Yeah, good, good evening, yes. Sir, I want to ask, just say, I'm a pharmacology study. Karte hai. To, sir, drugs jo hoti hai, wo ko kabhi -kabhi bhool jati hai, how to study. Bar-bar uh, bar revision is must for that. So you're saying that uh, you're a pharmacologist and you don't know how to remember the drugs, is that it? Sir, yes. Well, you have to, uh, what, what I do is, you know, there are, manuals available now that you can use and uh, those will give you uh, good uh, information but anything you have for for drugs one is you have to remember what the structure is so you know what what class of drug it is and so you once you re realize that it's on a certain class for instance antihypertensives some are beta blockers some are vasodil vasodilators and uh, some will work through the renin angiotensin system. So if you have a memory of which class it is and then how it acts, then you will remember about that drug. And, and if, they, if it, for instance, is a vasodilator, then does it cause vasodilation at a particular dose? And does it dilate the arterioles or does it dilate the venules? So if you have that start, thought structure in your mind, then you will be able to remember that class of drugs like that. So, and, and the most of the textbooks are, have these drugs classified based upon how they work and, and where they are functioning and where they're acting. Same thing for breakdown. Does the drug, is the drug broken down by the liver? And then are the breakdown products excreted by the kidney? So you will remember a little bit about the, the, uh, the how, how frequently you need to give the drug based on the pharmacokinetics, okay? Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. How many of you are, are pre-med students and how many of you are students? I have no clue uh, amongst the participants. Everybody is okay? Oh, you're a first-year med. Good. Are you enjoying your are you enjoying your first year medication medical school? Mm -hmm. 
Any more questions, guys? Aditya, yes. Aditya, please ask your question. Aditya, you may have to unmute first. So some of you are the final year in B farm, some of you are first year medical, uh, some final year, good, we have a combination. Friends, if you have further questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Any Good evening, sir. Yes. Yes, uh, sir, you told about the pharmacology. I'm a second year med student. So what do yeah. you recommend? Uh, what area of pharmacology would you recommend to study, to focus more? Well, I think the, as a medical student, you will, need to, you will need to learn pretty much everything that we have to do with treating patients. So, so you will need to learn about uh, treatment of infections, which is a big thing. You'll need to turn about treating diabetes. You will need to learn about treating hypertension. Uh, you'll not need to learn about treating cancer. How do you treat cancer? And, uh, you know, gout, all the diseases that we handle every day, the, the, there are drugs. And so you, you'll have to go through. The book that I read was uh, Goodman and Gilman for pharmacology was a very good book. And uh, it, has, it has all the, the chapters laid out properly. So we went through, so the, the way I tell my students is, now when you're taking care of patients, they will have a certain disease and certain illness, and they will be taking medications. So that is the time to quickly open your pharmacology book and learn as much as possible about the, the treatment for those diseases. Bronchial asthma is very common throughout the world. And, and then there are modern treatments these days for, for asthma. Monoclonal antibodies are, are quite new and they are being used a lot. So you've got to read about monoclonal antibodies. There are newer and newer treatments for psoriasis, things like that. So that's why I said, when you're in the clinical arena, any patient you see, you've got to go home that evening and read up about that disease, read up about the pharmacology, because that's the best time you will remember uh, what you did that day. And, and then, you know, so uh, medicine is dynamic. Yeah, and being dynamic, you have to, you know, take, take uh, advantage of that dynamism and, and read about that thing on that same day. So you will stay in your mind uh, forever. So. And, and then there are newer things that keep coming out. And if you have a system of learning what's present and remembering that, then you, and you use the, read the other stuff in, uh, in the publications as they come out. Do you, all of you have access to, the, to PubMed where you can look up uh, articles? I'm hoping you do. Here's a question about, uh, uh, is it wise to do postgraduate abroad after MBBS? Of course it is wise. I mean, uh, uh, in, in India, there's a need for general practitioners. So you will easily get a job after your MBBS, I'm sure. But, uh, but you need to advance to the next level. And if it's not easy to get into postgraduate medical school in India, then it's, it's a good idea to go somewhere where you can get your postgraduate uh, degree or training, okay? <clears throat> and the master's in healthcare, there's a question about master's in healthcare administration. The master's in healthcare administration uh, uh, is done for people who have a medical background. You could either be a doctor 
or you could even be somebody who has uh, done an MPH, for instance, and then wants to go into healthcare administration, then you can do a master's in healthcare administration. It's a degree program. It's, a, it's two years, and there are several programs, not only in the United States, but also in India. Now, PubMed, PubMed articles, you should be able to get through your medical schools because uh, all medical schools should have uh, library access for their students and they should allow them to use it for free. So if you're in a medical school, if they don't give you PubMed access, you need to make sure they do because all students should have access to PubMed. Is there any specific database for preclinical studies? Uh, I don't think there's any specific database, but, but I think it's best, you know, that the, at least here for the medical students, we create a manual that we give out to the students for each subject, and then they go through that manual. And then uh, uh, at the end of the sessions, they have an exam. So we have lots of uh, testing which we do after each session. And uh, only after they do well in those sessions are they allowed to progress to the next level. Any more questions? Friends, if you have any more questions, please ask, or we can wind up the session. Sir? Yes? Sir, sometimes we give the, uh, some drugs in combinations. So that we are called polydrug combination. What about that? Uh, it's, it's done a lot, especially in... Uh, in uh, Many countries, you have what's called the polypill. Uh, a new polypill has come out, which, which the studies for which were done in India. And, and that polypill treats hypertension. It treats cholesterol. And uh, it uh, uh, also treat, prevents the formation of clots to pre prevent an, a heart attack in patients in India. So the farmers uh, are now taking a polypill which has a nine hypertensive, it has a statin, and it has aspirin. So those polypool studies are done to help the masses. But when you use a combination of drugs as a, as a clinician, then you have, to remember, you have to remember that the combination can sometimes result in certain side effects. Uh, the other thing is the dosing can change because one drug can interfere with the metabolism of the other drug. So those combination and interactions uh, you will have to learn. And then there are programs actually that's, that have made it quite uh, simpler for us these days because of the electronic systems we have. So when we prescribe uh, multiple drugs, the program will tell you, hey, this combination is, is, will have this type of a problem. You may want to reconsider whether you want to use this combination. So, so it's a... Uh, it's something that you have to keep in mind. And uh, some of the drugs, for instance, will affect the metabolism of the other drug by interfering with the cytochrome systems in the liver. So that should be taught in your pharmacology classes. And, uh, and you can look up on the internet also, what are the combinations that are not working out quite well and might be a problem. For instance, Meperidine doesn't do well with some of the psychiatric medications, the MAO inhibitors. So we would try to avoid meperidine in those patients. So, so then it is safe to give the drugs in combination or not? Yeah, yeah, many drugs are given in combination. 
many patients these days are on, on lots of drugs where they take, uh, they, they, they take multiple medications. The only thing you have to remember is that some of the drugs cannot be combined. And in those cases, you may have to use an alternate form of drug. So when we don't give meperidine, we can use fentanyl or we can use morphine is okay, but we will avoid meperidine. So those are the things you have to look at in tables and uh, try to avoid the bad interactions. So nowadays, uh, nowadays like Corona is uh, very affecting the people. So the immuno um, you know, boosters which they are giving the uh, remedies, sir, they are antiviral drugs or analgesics. So what about the antiviral drugs? Sir, which fighting in the viruses. Hmm. So it is... Uh, Right now, we don't have a real good antiviral for the coronavirus. Uh, yes. people, are doing, people are doing research and, and some of these antiretroviral drugs are being uh, tested. I know that the companies are trying to come out with something that can, that can uh, prevent the virus from uh, multiplying. And uh, but those, if they do come out, then you have to take the, if, if you're concerned about a drug interaction, you have to take the risk benefit ratio and see which one is important. Is the risk okay to take or not? So you have to look at the risk benefit ratio. Thank you, sir. Yes. The thing with uh, what's happening Thanks, now sir. is people are trying to increase the immune response so that uh, uh, so that your immunity can handle the virus. So basically what you need to do for that is you got to make sure that there are no nutritional deficiencies that might interfere with the immune response. And if you uh, provide that nutrition, then hopefully the immune system will work properly and try to prevent the virus from multiplying. Thank you, sir. Good, sir. You know how engines are bringing pharmacopoeias with treatment. You're breaking up. Is it a common practice? You're breaking up. Can you type your question in the chat box, please? Yes. Yeah, I can't hear you completely. You're breaking up. Did somebody capture that question? Because I didn't get that question. Yeah, pharmacogenomics question is how important is pharmacogenomics? We are realizing every day the importance of pharmacogenomics. So what's happening is, especially in malignancy, they are, they are figuring out to see if there is a, is a, is a the gene uh, uh, that might might be something that might be different in some people who have cancer. So they're looking at the genetic workup of people. And then some patients might be fast responders and some patients might be slow responders. And, and so they're, they're trying to figure out what type of a genomic response you will get from the drug that you're giving. So some people will require, will respond to the drug completely absolutely and some may not even respond to the drug or they may need higher doses so pharmacogenomics is an upcoming field and uh, uh, it's going to play an important role in what's called individualized medicine medicine needs to be individualized anyway so with this pharmacogenomics it will be even more individualized and i think that's going to be a good thing for the future so uh, they're trying to look at uh, the relationship of the genetic makeup of people and how the, 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 those individuals respond to some of the drugs that they're using. We know that morphine, for instance, there are rapid metabolizers and there are slow metabolizers. 
And when we, when we have slow metabolizers, we can get into trouble because if you give them uh, more than the usual dose or when they go home, they might be over-narcotized. So it's, it's a good thing to have some pharmacogenomic background and that's picking up as we go. So I told you in the beginning that medicine is dynamic. We learn new things every day and we got to keep up with these changes. And that's why it keeps you up and, ex and it's, it's exciting to be able to do that. Yeah, we, we, uh, is it common practice in the US? Yeah, we try to do that as much as we can. We try to look at the pharmacogenomics and then uh, treat people accordingly whenever possible. Good question. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Sir, one more question. Yes. Sir, with, uh, in case of uh, uh, which will be the slowest step in the uh, tablet drug absorption? Slowest what? Sir, which, is, which will be the slowest step in the tablet drug absorption? The slowest step uh, depends upon if it's a tablet, it has to be given orally, right? So, okay, sir. so then it's, uh, it's going to go, depends upon how much is broken down in the stomach and whether that breakdown in, interferes with it or helps it to get absorbed. So it all depends on each uh, drug. Now, here's one question about, uh, let's see, which type of opportunities in MS Pharma biotechnology? Oh, there are lots of opportunities, biotechnology, especially in pharma. Like right now, you know, we have to make vaccines for, for the virus, right? There are different technologies they're using. Uh, messenger RNA technology, they're using the traditional technologies. So just like that, there are lots of opportunities for MS Pharma and biotechnology. So you should look at a university where such opportunities are available and even medical companies can, can, can get you in and get you trained if you have a good opportunity to, to do that. And uh, yeah, biotech is high, uh, pharma is very high. Good. If there are no more questions, I hope this was helpful to you and uh, we can interact again in the future. Uh, I thank the organizers for this opportunity to interact with all of you. Uh, Y'all are probably, I don't know, whether all over India or some other places also, but, uh, but good, to, good to get to meet you all. Thank you, sir. I'd love to take this opportunity to uh, thank Dr. Kumar Bilani, sir, for spending your valuable time from your busy schedule for all of us. I'd also like to thank all of you who have attended this webinar. And on behalf of doctor, I hope it was a productive session for all of you. So thank you once again. And we look forward to seeing you with our future webinars. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.